I'm the Public Health uh, Disease Surveillance Coordinator at the National Indian Health Board. And um, just want to remind everybody um, to please keep your phones and mic on mute um, and save your questions until the Q&A portion. And please use the chat box or the phone line for um, any questions you have. And as I mentioned um, earlier, this session will be recorded. Um, please note that um, if you do not consent to be recorded, you are um, requested to drop off um, of the meeting at this time. And thank you for your understanding and cooperation. So um, thank you again for joining the National Indian Health Board Tribal Public Health Data Modernization Learning Community Session today on Tribal Public Health Authority. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on the National Indian Health Board. Um, the National Indian Health Board was established by the tribes to advocate as the united voice of federally recognized American Indian and Alaska Native tribes. NIHB seeks to reinforce tribal sovereignty, strengthen tribal health systems, secure resources, and build capacity to achieve the highest level of health and well-being for our people, um, people in Indian country. And the Public Health um, Programs and Polish Policy Division, um, um, we who are holding um, this learning community, um, our vision is uh, working together to empower sovereign tribal nations to improve equity policy and public health systems that build thriving Native communities now and for the next seven generations. Um, so at this time, I will hand it over to our first speaker, Carrie Field. Um, she is the Senior Policy Analyst at the National Indian Health Board. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, let me pull up my slides here. So as she said, uh, my name is Carrie Field. I'm a senior policy analyst uh, here on our federal relations team at the National Indian Health Board. Um, so my background is in public health, public health policy. Um, and so I am I'm not a lawyer, but we will be looking at some of kind of the four core uh, legal concepts that undergird uh, some of the data issues that we're looking at in Indian country and how that relates to public health authority. Right, so this is all for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice by any means. Um, so as we get started in this, one of the really key things to keep in mind through the whole conversation is that we're talking about three different governments and that all three of those kind of come into play at different parts. Right, so there's federal government, state government, and tribal nations. Um, each of those has a role to play. Each of those has uh, has sovereignty. Each of those has their own laws. And so there's different places where those three jurisdictions um, intersect. And those are some of the places um, where some of the complications might arise. So it's just kind of a place to get started, looking at some of the really foundational principles of federal Indian law. So just in general, that's the framework of law that governs rights, relationships, responsibilities between those three governments that we were just talking about. So some of the really core components that are gonna be relevant, no matter what the topic is, is always going to be that uh, is tribal sovereignty, that tribes retain all of their inherent sovereignty that the federal government has not encroached upon, that the idea of federal plenary power. So that's the idea that Congress maintains authority to legislate matters that concern tribes, not states, um, and then kind of the corollary to that is that tribes maintain a government to government relationship with the federal government. Um, and so the federal government has jurisdiction over Indian country, but state law does not. And that's gonna be an important distinction. And then the last concept that's gonna be really important no matter what the topic is, is gonna be the federal trust responsibility. So because of the history and the treaties and the ongoing relationship between the tribes and the federal government, the government has um, acknowledged that there is a trust responsibility that exists there. So the federal government has assumed a trust responsibility towards tribal nations resulting from treaty language and from the role that it assumed with respect to limiting tribal sovereignty. So those are gonna be the, the key pieces when we're looking at how do these different governments relate to each other? 
And then the really the core of everything that we do at NIHB is tribal sovereignty. So tribes have inherent right and power to self-govern. They were sovereign nations long before there were any Europeans here. Um, that sovereignty has been retained through the, the formation of the United States. And it has been repeatedly recognized and affirmed by the Supreme Court, the Constitution, hundreds of treaties and federal statutes. So it's still in place. There are some places where the federal government has has put some limitations around it. Um, sometimes you'll hear the term like dependent, domestic dependent nations, which is how kind of tribal nations are in the eyes of the United States, like made it look a little bit distinct. But the sovereignty is still there and it's still kind of the core of, of everything that we do because it means that there is inherent rights there um, that extend into all of the different functionings of a government. Uh, and so part of that is the right. So that's the basis for the government to government relationship with the United States. That's the basis for American Indian Alaska Native as a term being a political status. Uh, in American law, it's a political status and not a racial category. Um, and so tribal sovereignty is the foundation of everything. Uh, and it is recognized by the constitution and by statutes, but it's not granted by federal law. It's inherent outside of federal law. Um, and then one of the pieces of that is gonna be the idea of data sovereignty, that any data gathered on tribal members belongs to that respective tribe. So flowing out of that inherent sovereignty, tribes have inherent public health authority. It's inherently a function of sovereignty. And so public health authority just in general means the authority to carry out public health activities to promote and protect the health of citizens. So that's just a job of a government. That's what governments do is they protect their citizens, right? Um, and so governments inherent that have sovereignty inherently have this function that they serve for their people. And so tribes don't depend on federal law or the United States government for their public health authority. It's inherently a function of their own sovereignty but it is recognized in federal law. So as tribes are carrying out um, these core functions as public health authorities to protect and, the, and promote the health of their citizens, right? there's gonna be different types of data that come into play there. So part of being a public health authority could include core public health activities like, um, like surveillance, like um, uh, disease investigations, right? So all, all of those different types of core public health activities have data that comes into play at, at different points. And so the types of data that tribes need to conduct public health uh, activities can have a really wide um, range of sources and the uh, different types of data can be important there. So then the question is, right, where does that data come from and then how does it flow to tribes? And that's where some of the questions and complications can start to come in. Right, so as you're kind of looking at the, the US public health system overall, there's, it's really built around states. That's kind of how a lot of systems in the United States have been designed. Um, and so you kind of see that, and this is an older chart of how like the, the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System functions, but it, it is kind of a, an effective shorthand for kind of what the public health system looks like overall. Right, so generally you have data flowing out of um, hospitals, healthcare providers, laboratories, that data flows to um, local or state public health authorities. Some of that data will be de-identified and go up to CDC and some of that will even go up to the World Health Organization. Um, this is kind of the, the standard flow of data for most of the United States. Um, but what you'll notice is that it's not very clear kind of where tribes fit into the picture here, uh, especially so, uh, because the public health in Indian country is a little bit more complicated, right? So as you're looking at you know, a group of citizens or citizens of three different sovereigns, uh, there are services provided by several different entities to members of tribes, right? So there can be services that are provided by tribes directly. There are some services provided by the Indian Health Service, which is a federal agency. There are some provided by tribal epidemiology centers. 
Um, some services are provided by states or counties, and then the CDC has a role as well. And so when you're looking at the public health system in Indian country, you're looking at this uh, kind of how that functions on the ground. It's going to look different tribe by tribe and state by state. Um, and you have all of these different players that are engaged. So then when you're looking at kind of where does the data come from, where does it flow to, who has access to it, it can get a lot more complicated. Uh, but that doesn't change the core idea that all tribes are inherently public health authorities. And if they want to be providing public health services to their people or to be doing public health surveillance, right, that is their prerogative and they, they have a right to access that data. Right, so one of the pieces in that public health system outside of the tribes themselves are the tribal epidemiology centers. Um, and I did want to give these a brief mention because they do have kind of a, a, a special place um, legally and kind of within the system. Um, so tribal epidemiology centers are charged by federal statute with carrying out certain public health activities on behalf of the tribes in consultation with the tribes. Right? And in the federal statute that established the tribal epidemiology centers, it specifically recognized them as being exempted from the data sharing restrictions in HIPAA and recognize them as designated tribal epidemiology centers as public health authorities for the purposes of HIPAA. Um, so you can see that there is a difference there between texts as designated public health authorities for this very narrow purpose of data sharing um, within HIPAA guidelines um, versus the inherent public health authority of tribes that's derived from their sovereignty and is much broader. So one of the more recent developments looking at, at data sharing and policy um, was a government accountability office report that came out a couple of years ago looking at, uh, at the techs and their access to data, especially during COVID, right? And so part of the reason that they did this investigation um, was because there is a section of that federal statute that says the secretary, meaning that the secretary of health and human services and, and all of the agencies within HHS shall grant to each tech access to the use of data, data sets, monitoring systems, delivery systems, and other protected health information. So any protected health information that's under HHS and those data sets and data systems are supposed to be accessible to the techs under federal law. Um, but so, uh, so the GAO was charged with investigating whether that was actually happening in practice. And their conclusion was that despite clear authority and the need for health data, that techs face immense barriers to accessing data held by federal agencies, right? So it, it really highlighted that there can be a difference between what's in the law or where there's a legal right um, versus what's actually happening in practice and that there can be a, a chasm in between there. So one thing that a lot of people have pointed out is that the, the GAO report was specifically about text and didn't examine tribal access to data. And one of the reasons for that um, is this, uh, is because of the way the statutes are written. So the GAO was charged with investigating if that piece of the federal statute was being carried out in practice as it would Congress intended, right? Because GAO is writing this report for Congress. Um, and so and so that statute is very clear that right, it directs the federal government to give data to techs. And then since techs work in consultation with the tribes, they can pass data to tribes, right? But there isn't an equivalent statute in federal law that lays out that clearly and specifically that the federal government must also share that data with tribes. So tribes have that legal right to that data through their sovereignty, through their public health authority, through the federal trust responsibility of all of the things that the federal government owes tribes in order to protect the health of American Indians and Alaska Natives. Tribes absolutely have a right to that data legally, but because it's not spelled out clearly in statute, it's a lot harder to enforce it because it's harder to point to where that authority comes from. It takes, um, 
even though it does, the authority is there and is clear, it's not in writing in the statute in the same way. So that's part of the one of the challenges to tribal data access. Um, and some of the other ones that we've kind of hinted at a little bit, but because the, the public health system is kind of built around states, states control most access to public health data. Um, so even though tribes have that clear authority, uh, the public health authority and the sovereignty that they should be able to access it, they need to access it, they have a right to access it. In practice, tri states, states become the de facto arbiters of who can access it and who can't. And so that means that it's really up to the relationship between the tribe and the state about whether or how the tribe can access data that they need, right? So, and that can be a problem for many reasons, um, right? Like the tribes and states don't have um, super positive relationships everywhere um, for many good reasons. But then even in states where you have officials that are trying to be cooperative, some of them may lack understanding around tribal sovereignty. They may not understand tribal public health authority, um, or there may be other state privacy laws that can restrict data sharing. And so, be, and so they'll the state attorneys will point to like, well, we can't share any data with you because tribes aren't mentioned as an exception in our state privacy law, right? And so those can create extra barriers that are, are can be difficult to um, for tribes to get around. Um, and part of the reason that we kind of have all these issues is the exclusion of, of tribal nations from decision-making and input on federal and state government of use of tribal and AIN data. Um, and then a lot of these issues really come back to a lack of enforcement mechanisms, right? So tribes have a legal right to data, but they don't have any way to compel data sharing, right? So they can request data from the state, they can request data from healthcare providers, but there's no way to make those entities follow through and provide the data. Um, so for example of like some, um, in some cases, one of the enforcement mechanisms that states can use, right? They can put into a state law, for example, that a health officer has subpoena power for certain types of data, right? So uh, some states will have that like for their maternal mortality review committees they'll say that the the health officer can subpoena an entity that has records that they need for their case review and if the like, hospital doesn't share the medical records then they can take it to the court and the court can hold the hospital in contempt and then there are legal consequences right so there's there's enforcement measures that can be carried out to back up the requirement of data sharing but that doesn't exist on the tribal side in the same way because tribes are so often needing data that's being held outside of the tribal system. Um, and so that's where some of those barriers can come in. And then all those access issues can become are compounded because of the chronic underinvestment in tribal public health infrastructure. So there's not the same capacity for data systems, for data scientists, epidemiologists, legal counsel, uh, which are really all necessary for establishing like, beneficial data sharing agreements and, and ensuring that that flow of data is happening as needed. So to get a little bit more uh, specific and have kind of some examples of kind of where, uh, what authorities and agreements might be needed to access data from different sources uh, to try to clarify some of this a little bit, right? So if the data is coming from a tribal entity. So it's from a tribal medical examiner, a tribal healthcare provider, right? Then the tribe has, you know, their inherent public health authority is includes the right to data access. And then the tribe always has the option to pass a, a tribal law or resolution that can require that those tribal entities report certain health events like a notifiable disease or like births and deaths, right? Um, and then if a tech wanted that kind of data, they would need to have a data use agreement in place with whatever tribes um, they were working with that you know, had a purpose for collecting that data. If the data is coming from a state, then it's a little bit different in how that's gonna work, right? So 
Um, and then here's where you start to get into some, sometimes you know, one of the questions that gets raised a lot is around HIPAA, right? And kind of where does that come into play? Um, and so the answer is that for a lot of things, HIPAA doesn't apply if you're talking about government to government, um, if you're talking non-covered entities. So any agencies that are not providing healthcare services are not health insurers, um, they're generally not covered by HIPAA. So HIPAA is just not even involved. So if you're talking about like a state vital records office or other non-clinical state sources, those are usually gonna be non-covered entities. So HIPAA is just not even in the picture here. Um, so then a tribe has the inherent public health authority and data sovereignty that gives them a right to access that data. They still have to request it from the state. And if the state says no, there's not a lot of recourse that the tribe has. Um, and so data use agreements can be extremely useful for making establishing the flow of that data and making terms that are gonna be beneficial for everybody. Um, if you're looking at a tech, um, that's largely, if it's within the statutory function of the tech that of what they need that data for and it, including, right, that they have the, the consent of the tribes, um, right, then they can request it in a similar way, but they're gonna have a stronger policy support if they have a really clearly, um, the tribal resolutions or MOU of like supporting that tech data access. And again, if they have a DOA with the state. And then if you're looking at, like, I need, you know, medical records from a healthcare provider, but it's not a tribal healthcare provider. Um, then those are gonna be HIPAA covered entities that the tribe has very little control over, right? So they still have that public health authority. HIPAA has a very clear exemption for sharing data with public health authorities. So HIPAA is again, not a problem here, but it's also not really a solution because, so HIPAA allows the data sharing, but it doesn't compel it. Um, it just means it's not gonna be an extra barrier. Um, so you would still want to have like a data use agreement in place likely um, in order to make that function smoothly. Um, and then similarly, right, as we said earlier, techs are specifically um, designated as public health authorities for the purposes of HIPAA in federal law. Um, and so you'd still wanna have like the tribal resolutions or MOUs supporting the tech data access and you probably still need DUAs in place, um, but HIPAA is also not gonna be an issue there. So even, so the part of the reason that the, the DUAs can be really important part of that equation is both to facilitate that the access is happening, but then also to help make sure that all of the other pieces are happening the way that the tribe needs them to, right? Because data access is more than, there's a lot of other pieces involved, right? So some of those are here, right? So you're talking about data sovereignty, you're talking about the process, right? How do you make a request for data? the timing of how fast that data is provided, what format it is in, what does it include or not include? Is it possible to get direct access to the data system itself? Are, are tribes getting the same access to data that states are, if you're talking about like a federal source of data, right? And so those can all be really important because we've seen cases, right? Where federal the federal agency is saying, like we're providing data access to tribes. So like, why do tribes keep saying that there's an issue? But the tribe, on the other hand, is saying, well, you're giving us these reports, but they're only coming out like quarterly or every six months, and we're trying to do case investigations. So it's really not giving us the full data we need to do a case investigation. It's not fast enough for that to be practical. And like what we really want is direct access into RPMS in order to track the cases in real time, right? And so there's a disconnect between kind of how each side is defining data access and that's creating problems, right? And so there's a lot of kind of those other facets of, you know, even though you have, um, right, like the authority to access data, how that's playing out can create other barriers too. So kind of wrapping up here, these, um, Five components on the left are, are some of the pieces that we often talk about as being kind of foundational for health equity for tribes, that these are some of the pieces that absolutely have to be part of the picture. Um, and I think a lot, they really translate well into where we're trying to move with data modernization in order 
for data access and data equity to be contributing to health equity for tribes, right? So data sovereignty is gonna be really crucial there, data access based on tribal sovereignty and tribal public health authority. Uh, resilience through culture comes into play in respecting indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous approaches to data, strong tribal institutions, increasing tribal data capacity, building strong interoperable integrated tribal data systems, um, making sure that tribal consultation is happening with state and federal governments so and that tribes are at the table as new systems are being created, right? So one of the really promising um, developments, right, that a lot of you are aware of is the electronic case reporting, right? So that's a way of, of redesigning a system so that states aren't inherently in the middle of everything um, and making sure that tribes are having equal footing, right? Tribes have just as much access to the data that they have a right to. Right, and so having tribes at the data table as systems are created means that we can make sure that those systems are more equitable. Uh, and then the federal trust responsibility, which includes right the, the responsibility of making sure that there's investment in data infrastructure in Indian country, um, including the IHS data modernization. So making sure that tribes have what they need in order to protect the health of their people, which the federal government has a trust responsibility to protect. So wrapping up, uh, under the public health authority and principles of data sovereignty, tribes absolutely have a right to health data about their citizens, but public health data systems are largely built around states, which creates complications for tribes whose government to government relationship is with the United States. So you see a mismatch between the, the way that the tribes function within the United States versus the way that the public health system was designed. Uh, and so in many cases, there is no legal mechanism to enforce tribes' right to data access or to compel non-tribal entities to share data. Um, uh, but in other cases, um, tribes, tribal laws and resolutions can provide strong policy support to back tribal data access, right? So you, those can compel data sharing within a tribe and from tribal entities and anything under the tribe's jurisdiction. But having those resolutions and laws in place can also provide support for when the tribe is, is requesting data from a state or from another entity. Uh, a lot of like legal counsel for, for hospitals or state health departments will have an easier time uh, acknowledging, right, that like the need for the data if there's a very clear tribal resolution saying like, the, like by tribal law, like this type of data reporting is required or, um, or establishing where the public health authority within the tribal government sits, right? So you don't have to have those in place. The authority is, still exists, but it's easier to kind of maneuver legally if you have some of those policy structures kind of explicitly built out. And then finally, um, tribal public health data access can improve with innovative data systems, with expanded awareness of tribal sovereignty and public health authority, with greater inclusion of tribes in decision-making and system building, and with strengthened federal laws and policies that improve clarity and reinforce tribal sovereignty. And we have seen some progress. Um, there's a, a tribal data access bill that is currently kind of being workshopped in Congress um, that we're hopeful will move forward and would provide a lot of that clarity would put very explicitly in writing that tribes haven't the same have a right to access federal data right so some of those pieces that have been missing so far um, we're hoping we'll be able to get in that bill and it will move forward um, and at the same time HHS is also working on a tribal data access policy um, they put forward earlier this year a draft that um, had a tribal consultation and and now they're they're significantly reworking it but the hope is that if we have some strong policy support there too then that will improve how data flows from the federal government the different agencies within hhs to tribes the way it's supposed to um, so uh that's it for me and i'll hand it over to pamela so thanks for listening Thank you, Carrie. Um, so, hey, everybody, my name is Pamela Gutman. Um, I am a Cherokee citizen and I work 
um, for the Cherokee Nation. I lead the team of epidemiologists there. Um, and I'm basically going to talk to you. And so Carrie's presentation is more about data coming, getting data, but what happens about data going out? And so my focus is going to be kind of from a tribal lens. Um, what about data the other direction? And so I'm not going to, you know, go over everything wonderfully stated by Carrie, um, but I am going to define some terms because I always like to start out with some understandings. Um, and I think I'm going to focus more on the data side because I'm a data nerd. So um, that's what I'm going to focus heavily on and not so much on the legality of tribal sovereignty or public health, even though we're going to mention that in this presentation. Um, so starting off, you guys just heard tribal sovereignty is really um, enacted by the United States. It's something that is inherent to tribes. Um, and it's really the ability to govern your own people, um, enact laws over your own economy and your culture and everything. Whereas public health authority is more of a term that is referencing specific activities for public health and the authority to um, do functions of a public health department. It is considered parallel um, to the tribal sovereignty. So it is just a piece. It's just representing the piece that we already have under tribal sovereignty. Um, the thing to note about this, as, as Carrie mentioned, is that it's not unique to tribes. So public health authority um, opens up authority to all public health entities that are um, encompassed underneath it. Um, so it's not something that is specific to a tribe. Um, we're going to talk more about what that means, but it is um, a coexisting authority among uh, tribal sovereignty. And then these two top terms, it's important to note that those are in reference to a United States law, principle, act, code, whereas the last term, data sovereignty, is not. Data sovereignty is more of an intellectual concept, an aspirational idea about what we want to achieve, and it is a global term. So it is not something that is unique to America. Um, it is a conceptual idea. Um, and so data sovereignty is really this concept that the originator of a data source or the owner of a data source should be recognized as having complete control over how it's used, protected, and accessed. Um, so when we talk about tribal um, sovereignty and data sovereignty, they're kind of similar in the fact that they're both about authority over, um, you know, your own people. And, but it's, you should know that, um, you know, when we talk about this from a uh, data sovereignty standpoint, um, it's going to be thought of very differently. Um, and so lots of tribes are very interested in these conversations around data sovereignty and what that looks like for any individual. Um, because, you know, people are making decisions about what we define data sovereignty as and what are the, the concepts that we should be applying to, whether they're systems or technologies. And they may not necessarily have any knowledge at all about tribal sovereignty or public health authority. Um, and they may not even be from America. Um, so it's it's really important that whenever you see discussions on, on data sovereignty that you join them because they're gonna have lots of different viewpoints from many different people. Um, Cause again, this is an, an intellectual concept. It's not like a rule or regulation. Um, so it's important that um, we stay abreast of what's happening with that. And I've noticed that tribes really do like to um, join these conversations. And I think it's mostly because of that authority that kind of gets tacked on to this concept of data sovereignty. Um, so let's talk about how um, does public health authority and data sovereignty intersect. Um, and while we could talk a lot about um, public health authority and all of the functions of public health, which are vast, by the way, um, let's focus more on the data sovereignty side, because I think we can limit it down if we look more at the principles of data sovereignty. So the concept of data sovereignty really only has three major principles. Um, the first one is where should data be located? Um, the next one is how should data be controlled? And the last one is how is it used? Um, and so I re it's really important to think about these concepts um, together, but in pieces and how they relate to public health. So data location is the concept that data should be held in the ownership or jurisdiction or the region where the data is um, made. So. I like to think of this when we think about public health as like research or surveillance and not so much investigation um, because investigation really falls under more of the protection of health. Um, it already has a lot of legal protections around it. But when we think about data sovereignty concepts, I think location is more about what are the regions that you're looking at when you're, you're analyzing or pulling data. 
Um, another thing to note about location is that when we say under data sovereignty, where should data be located? Um, we're not just talking about the geographical location. As technologies um, advance and we get more and more virtual spaces and we have cloud servers and things like that, sometimes we're referencing the ownership of location. Where, who is the owner? So basically like think about it this way, France owns French data. Um, and so a tribe, Cherokee should own Cherokee data, not necessarily that it's located um, within Cherokee Nation. Um, so keep that in mind. You can have a server system that's not located within your reservation, but it's still considered under the discussion of data sovereignty location. The next one is um, really how do we use data? Um, and the way that we think about the use of data can, can be thought about in two ways. One is the secondary use. Um, so you collect data for a purpose, a reason, um, and it's used, but then it's stored. What, how is it used again? What do we use it for in the future? What are some of the, the principles that we need to think about about it? Um, and then the second way of thinking about it is, again, this is a global term. So businesses think about use as in how do we disseminate information to third party agencies um, for our use or for monetary gain? Um, so that's what we think about when we think about use. Um, in my opinion, use is probably one of the biggest proponents of how tribal governments facilitate the expansion of public health infrastructure. Um, how your data is used and what you use it for is really the foundation of how you build the infrastructure for public health and setting up your authority around public health. Um, the next one that we talk about is control. So data control is by far the most topic that is brought the most by tribes. Um, and this is, again, the concept of who has permission to access or obtain your data. Um, and I really think that this is a firm, loyal principle to public health departments, is that data should be owned by um, a tribal public health department or um, by a tribal health department um, if it's made by the tribe. Um, and so we kind of say really form, firm to this um, concept of control, but both data use and data control principles um, kind of change the way that you have partnerships with other public health departments and the way that you develop or allocate resources to what you're doing in your public health department. So um, that in consideration with how we look at public health authority, you'll see that when we think about protection and control, it kind of like, ro like locates back to how we think about those partnerships and those policies, but also about the investigations and services that we provide. Um, so it's important that you think of control and use as a joint um, venture. So let's talk about, um, you know, how, what are the outcomes that we get from kind of looking at public health authority and its use against data sovereignty in a tribal perspective? So honestly, it's really a mixed bag. Um, there's some good and there's some bad. So when we think about it from an internal tribal development point of view, um, it can be defined very differently. Um, so tribes themselves have all of these neutral power from the public public authority. So again, tribal sovereignty and tribal public health authority, you're not really gaining anything um, overall from having that, that the document or making documents around public health authority because it's already enacted to you under tribal sovereignty. Um, it's nice to have though, when you're talking about developing relationships for data coming inward, um, because a lot of times people don't understand tribal sovereignty um, and it can be really useful when you're talking to um, other people about it, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so in some examples of the capacity, the larger capacity that public health authority may give um, public health um, facilities is the use of data. And what I mean by that is imagine a situation in which data is being used or, or collected and gathered about your tribe um, but you don't have control over it because public health authority is allowing other entities to access data on their region, which may cross jurisdictional boundaries that are similar to yours. So an example that I can give is like CMS data. So CMS is considered the owner of data that, that comes to CMS. 
Um, and so if they're passing your information off to another public health authority that is asking for that data under that public health authority document or concept, they'll give it over. And so in a way it's impacting your ability to conduct data sovereignty. You can't set bounds um, on the data use. You can't set controls on the permissions that are afforded to you under your data sovereignty um, concepts or ideas. So it can be very impactful on the way that we think about how public health can actually impact the way that tribes think about their data sovereignty and even the data sovereignty that they have for themselves. And so, as I said before, let's talk about tribal health partnerships though. This is where it can improve. So public health authority can actually help you um, um, implement data sovereignty to other outside agencies. So a lot, of, like I just said, a lot of times people do not understand tribal sovereignty or, or the concepts of a tribe. We're often considered the same as a state or a federal agent. So when I'm talking to people and I'm asking about data and setting up agreements and things like that, they're like, oh, so you're like a state or a federal agent. It's like, no, there's, there's differences. So this document or this concept can actually help with the conversations that you have with these individuals. Um, because that's something that they understand. That is something that they can reference and know. Um, so having that public health authority document, it actually helps you with these conversations with professionals, academic institutions, whoever, around what you need um, in order to expand your services and your public health department. Um, it can also help you um, pass authority to an expert. So a lot of times, you know, working in a tribe myself, we don't always have access to all the resources that a state facility would have or a federal, um, you know, like CDC or someplace like that. So we often outsource some of our expertise in order to provide services to all of our tribal members at the level that a state would. Um, but this having public health authority allows you to kind of do that. So you can establish yourself with, a, let's say, a laboratory to collect samples on infectious illness, and you wanna send those, those samples out for testing, um, you can do that. Under tribal sovereignty, we have the right to do that. And as a public health entity myself, um, you know that laboratory is in association with me and I have agreements in place with them. Um, so therefore they're acting on, on my behalf. Um, and so the hospitals that we are associated with can then immediately just send those, those samples directly to that facility. Um, and that facility can process the information and, and, and conduct that on our behalf. Additionally, it helps setting up codes and rules and laws that would normally not be there because you don't have the expertise. So a laboratory, you may not know everything that there is to know about how to process that sample or the regulations and rules around it. The laboratory can provide those codes to you as a tribe and your public health department, and those can be enacted once the um, tribal health department takes them on. So that's kind of the, the nice concept to having public health authority as a, as a leveraging tool to explain to people why why you're you know using this person or this entity or whoever um, as you're enacting on your public health behalf. Um, it is important to to note though that um, that is really part of data tribal sovereignty again. So again, public health authority is just there to explain that concept, but it, you're really enacting tribal sovereignty when you do that. And then that expands the ability to create much more services for your entire tribe. Okay, so now that we've considered how we implement um, like public health authority, let's talk about how you build data sovereignty because that's really important. Again, the first two concepts are kind of established in law and they have rules and codes around them. So there's limitations on what you can do. Whereas data sovereignty is a conceptual idea. So there's really no limit to how you build it. Um, it's really just what you're willing to consider. Um, so I don't wanna go into all of it because it, we wanna stay in the focus of health and public health, but um, the, there's some things that you can look at that you can start with to help you build out a data sovereignty plan, or as it's known in the government, a data governance plan. Um, and I think the first most important thing is to establish the what. And what I mean by that, it seems kind of apparent, like, of course, we want to know what we're, we're collecting, but what are you defining as data? And this is really important to tribes because it's not always, you know, a case investigation record or, you know, some kind of patient chart. It's not an Excel spreadsheet all the time. Sometimes it's, you know, culture, history, religion. Um, that can also be data. 
So data is nothing more than a record of information. And so it's really important that you establish right off the bat, what are you defining as data when you build a data sovereignty plan um, for a tribe? And then the next thing that you wanna think about is, um, oh, something to consider when you think about data. You can't put everything under data sovereignty. And what I mean by that is, there's no way to protect all data that you have. Um, it's just not possible because all closed data or all open data um, isn't accessible and therefore it, data sovereignty becomes irrelevant. So there is always going to be data knowledge and stuff that is not protected under data sovereignty. So it's important that you understand that it's not gonna be an all encompassing um, plan that you're building. Um, it's really around the, the critical points that you want to create sovereignty for, um, not to control and um, you know limit all data access. So the next thing that we wanna do is we wanna understand how data could be transitioned. So coming off of that concept of data cannot be completely controlled, it can also not be completely sealed. Um, especially in health, we use data to and pass it back and forth between professionals in order to improve outcomes for individuals. So it's really important that we actually transition data back and forth um, and that we don't just keep it in one isolated area, otherwise not doing anybody any good. Um, but some things to consider about this is who are the internal and external agents that you're going to be including in any kind of data transmission? How will you track data transfer? How do you track the accountability for you, how you use data between agents? And what I mean by that is when somebody gets data and they're using it, how do you know that they're using it the way that you want them to and that they're not using it some other way? Additionally, how are you ensuring that they're not making copies of the data or piecemealing it off into other ways? Um, and then who should have authority over what types of data are being processed? Um, and where should the data triggers be? So when we call it, we call them end triggers and these are for emergencies or violations. So where should those be and how should those lie and, and who should be enacting those? And then the last thing that we usually consider as we're building a data sovereignty plan is what are the types of data? Um, and again, like I said before, data isn't always an Excel spreadsheet. Um, sometimes it can be more. Um, so like, for example, what if you had a photograph or a graphic, um, like maybe you have an intellectual concept and you, you have a logic graphic or something, what are the policies around that going to look like versus the policies around a patient record? Um, so having as many professionals on board as possible really helps get you this diverse plan because it's not going to be limited to just health record information. Um, especially as we advance and we start looking um, more and more at social determinants of health. In tribes, that can include a lot of different ways, both quantitative and qualitative, that we pull information. So really having a bunch of tribal leaders and experts at the table when you're building these plans is vital to ensuring that you get that kind of data sourcing and data policy um, understanding from the beginning, because it's really hard to fix once you've already kind of built a governance or data sovereignty plan. And then um, the next one is, um, so how does public health authority impact data sovereignty? Um, and so overall, when we think about this, um, the way to think about it is that public health authority and data sovereignty um, establish foundational concepts um, for public health and setting policies and codes and services. It's really in impacting the empowerment of interaction between two agencies or between internal agencies um, within the tribe. Um, however, it's really important that you understand that public health authority is not, it's just a function of tribal sovereignty. It is not giving you any additional um, power over anything um, you didn't already have as a tribe. Um, and then you remember that you're going to have to continue to explain, even with the public health authority documents and even with more knowledge around what's going on with public health authority, you're still going to have to have these conversations and establish these boundaries um, with every single agency, as Carrie had pointed out earlier, um, you're going to set up these agreements, have these conversations, develop these relationships with these other agencies about tribal sovereignty and your data sovereignty plan and what that means, um, how data is going to be given to them and whether it's not going to be given to them at all. Um, really having those discussions and establishing that um, right from the get in your relationship is really important. So 
having public authority doesn't necessarily um, negate all of those other foundational relationship buildings that you have to have. Um, it's just a really good tool to kind of explain what you're you're trying to achieve between two agencies. Wado, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, um, Pamela and Carrie. At this point, we'll open up to Q&A. Feel free to unmute your microphones to ask a question or post your questions in the chat. Jim Jollison at the National Network of Public Health Institutes. Uh, I, I had a question I'd like to ask. Um, for, well, first, thank you for this uh, presentation. I thought it was fantastic. And, um, you know, and I'm I'm very familiar with um, you know the dynamic between states and um, state public health agencies and healthcare providers with respect to public health uh, surveillance and data exchange, um, and you know there you know the, as I understand it each state has um, regulations related to which health conditions or diseases get reported to the state uh, or local public health agency. And so I'm wondering uh, how that that dynamic um, obtains with with tribal public health authorities. Is there do have have tribes and tribal public health authorities, you know, identified the specific conditions you know, that, that, um, they want data on, or, you know, what's, what's the analogous dynamic there? And, and I can try again, if, if that's not clear. Thanks. I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, so Jim, yeah, I think that's a very, um, good question and it's a very complex question. So mm -hmm. it's not like I can speak for every tribe because they're all very vastly different and they're all at different levels of their, um, public health and health, um, capabilities. Um, I will say that um, reportable conditions or diseases, as you're refer referencing here, that's a good point. So yes, a public health authority can act as the reporting agency for a tribe. Um, the, the question is whether or not certain partnerships for hospitals or clinics will allow that. So certain um, billable agents will not allow you to report to a tribe because they do not identify the tribes as the public health entity. Um, and so they require you to report to a state entity. Um, but legally, as I understand it, yes, I can. So for my tribe, I can act as the, um, you know, the person who you report all the cases to me, and that is considered reporting to a public health department. Um, but, you know, certain agencies, CMS, whatever, they're going to be like, did you report this to the state? And that might impact the, the rating that that hospital has. Um, so oftentimes they will report to both. Um, and it's really a question of a conversation of what your tribe, how far do they want to go with their data sovereignty? Um, so yes, in some, in our case, what we're building is they report to us, we report approvable things from the tribe to the state. So it's still getting back to the state. Again, it's about the transfer of data. I do want the state to know because, you know, diseases don't stop at the border of my reservation. Um, so I want them to be aware of what's happening just as much as we want to know what's happening on their side. Um, but I think it's important that um, there's that sovereignty there, that you're that I am the public health authority for my reservation and that you don't report to a state. Um, but it gets really sticky. There's so much to it, um, especially like if you're using a third party lab. That lab by law has to report to the state, even if you don't want them to, because that's mm. their protocol. So it gets really, really, really complex. Um, but yes, the question is that you can do it both internally and externally. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And thanks again for this presentation. Hi, I'm Sam Hurst. I'm from UCSD in San Diego. And I thought this was one of the best presentations I've heard in a long time. Um, and much of the research that I've been involved with uh, 
has been looking at all of the things that you were talking about. And I really appreciated the comments about the fact that not all data um, can be protected under sovereignty. And I think that maybe uh, is not something all tribal people do understand and what their impression of tribal data sovereignty is about. But I wanted to specifically ask you about urban Indian health centers. There's a very good question to you in chat right now about what does the Cherokee Nation do about tribal members living off the reservation? Um, much of the research I've recently been doing on breast cancer screening is at urban Indian health centers. But almost all of these women, I, I would say all of the women that I've um, worked with are all tribal members. So in what way can their tribes have access to their health data if they feel that that data is important to be managed by the tribe in some way. Um, and then this is sort of a larger deviation, but on the same thing with all of the really large AI machine learning genomic projects that are out there running amok um, how do native people who, who may enroll in these projects protect their data? And what statutes within tribal public health authority or tribal data sovereignty may exist to help them in that protection? Sorry, it was really long. <laughs> well, that's fine. I can answer the first part. I'm going to let Carrie do the statue part because that's outside of my purview. But um, as far as data and um, how we deal with people that are on or off reservation, as somebody who lives off of the reservation myself, I live in the Muskogee reservational area. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and so I think it comes back to um, one, defining your um, agreements with certain agencies that are collecting information, um, defining them so that they include your citizenry. Um, I will say some of the relationships that you build with federal agents, um, like we're building relationships direct to CDC, um, those kind of encompass all citizenry. Um, but then the question I have back at people who, who ask that is, are you willing to share a registration list with these agencies of every person that exists, um, whether they live on or off the reservation? Um, and oftentimes the answer is no. Um, and so how are they supposed to define whether this person is actually your citizen or not? Um, and I think the question that you're asking is more of a more encompassing question of American Indian or Alaska Native data. Um, and that you're now in the bandwagon with every public health department that wants that data too. Um, and so as part of that data sovereignty, so for example, like me, I live on the Muscogee Nation, they may not have a data sovereignty plan where they're like, no, we're not going to give out information about Native Americans that live on our land. And that would include me, even though I'm a citizen of the tribe. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation where you have to set those relationships and agreement in place and you have to have that back and forth um, relationship. But um, there are ways to get data about your citizens and then about citizens and then cross reference it off hand on your on your um, side to your registry. It's a lot harder to do than it seems, but it can be done. Thank you. Carrie, can you take the other half of that? Yeah, can you, sorry, can you repeat it? Like, what was the other piece of the question? Uh, well, based on the, on the research that I've been involved with for a while, I, I do know about some of the challenges that exist, particularly in these large scale genomic studies in which um, there, there is an obvious um, effort by NIH in particular um, they claim for the purpose of representation to have all American Indian and Alaska Native people enrolling in these studies so that they can build these biorepositories in a much more representative way. But um, I'm concerned that there are no protections in place 
um, for any of these people who do enroll and some tribes don't want their citizenry to enroll in these types, types of studies. So I'm wondering what, what can tribes do to protect their own tribal members who might enroll or what better relationship can be created with NIH? I know CDC was mentioned, but there's a lot of health data research with NIH going on and it doesn't appear that there's any safeguards. Yeah, so getting into health research is a little bit different, right? So the, most of the conversation today is about like public health authority and, and health research is kind of a different piece. Um, so I won't get into it in, in detail because there are some other questions, but but there are it's it's a there's some robust conversation happening between tribes and NIH right now, especially around the, the All of Us research project that you're referencing. Um, so that project actually got held up for months um, because the uh, the the NIH Tribal Advisory Committee in particular uh, raised some very serious concerns about it, and I just said like we're gonna wait before we like publish anything or you know advance until we have like a better answer for how to handle the tribal concerns um so they're kind of still uh, you know working through that kind of one piece at a time trying to make sure that there's better protections there um and that like tribal sovereignty is being honored on on that on that one specifically um i think kind of in general there's a lot of concerns around research that needs more work um and yeah, I guess I'll just leave it there for now. Um, I like because there are the general kind of laws around research protections, um, but you're right that there's not as strong of policy support around the tribal sovereignty side of those pieces too. So there is some more work to be done there. Um, I saw a question in the chat about um, about UIOs. Um, I will say just you know to be transparent, like I don't work in the UIO space very often. Um, you know, NIH represent, NIHB represents um, the tribe specifically, but I will say just in general, having data sharing agreements and data use agreements are helpful just for the clarity that they provide, that they, um, they give everybody the, uh, the same idea, right, about how this data will be used, how it will be stored, who has access to it, are there any secondary uses. So anywhere that you can build in that kind of clarity is generally helpful. Um, and then UIOs, I think, because they are in a kind of unique situation, right, so they're, they probably do have state laws that they have to comply with about certain kinds of data reporting. Um, but it, you know, to the extent that they can build agreements with tribes too, to make sure that tribes are also getting the data that they need. Um, it, it seems like that's moving in the right direction also. Um, so I hope that helps whoever asked that one. And just to jump in with UIOs, um, the NICUI does have a project related to data modernization and resources on this. So I will put um, the link to their uh, website in the chat, but they would be a really good resource to reach out and they do have staff who have some expertise in this. I'll also follow up by saying, um, again, as far from a data sovereignty standpoint, a UIO is included. So again, data sovereignty is a conceptual idea and whoever owns, whoever is identified as owning the data or generating the data or basically the originator, they that is included in. So they could have, you can, any entity or any country or anybody can have a data sovereignty plan um, and they probably should build one. Um, and it's really, if you're the owner of the data, then you're the one who can establish that data sovereignty. There is a question in the chat about any TA opportunities that um, could um, create or help to create agreements and understandings between states and tribal nations. Could either of you take a stab at that question? So, um, I mean, that's also very complex. <laughs> every state is very different and every tribe is even more so. Um, and so the relationships that are um, created between them and the agreements that are created between them are very different. Um, I would say, you know, I'll let Carrie get into specifics about um, like maybe some key things or principles that should be in, in a DUA. But um, I would say it's, it's mostly um, what I think about it is 
to partners that are trying to use their operational foundations and trying to find the middle ground. Um, so each entity is operating completely separate from each other and you're trying to find where you can agree. Um, and I think the best way to go about that is to understand um, that you're going to have to define exactly the data that you wish to get. You can't have blanket agreements. Um, when you do stuff like that, it gets really um, sticky and, and kind of, um, they don't ever get used pretty much. But if you have very specific agreements on specific policies and specific operations, then they do get used and they are respected. And there are ways to build out DUAs so that there's like, uh, like a core foundational component that's flexible and broader and then kind of has specific like addenda onto it about like specific data sets or kind of like um, those really clear processes and data that, that Pamela was just referencing. Um, I will say though that it is like, you know, like she was saying, it's really dependent on the tribe and on the state, on the the local, on the you know state privacy laws, right? So you really do need to have your own legal representation involved in that process. Um, so Sarah said in the chat, you know, we can NIHB can provide some TA, um, but really, if you're looking at, at developing legal agreements between a tribe and a state, you really do need to have. Um, have legal representation also that's going to be more uh, have all of the in-depth knowledge of, of state law and of the tribal sovereignty piece and of like kind of the the really specific data issues that are going to get into the play there and one last question is related to promoting interoper interoperability in tribal hospitals to promote um tribal sovereignty could any of you speak to um, how um, that can be leveraged in any way? Um, I'll give it a shot. Again, I am a public health epidemiologist person, so I'm not, um, you know, versed in medical uh, facilities as as well as I am in um, public health data. Um, but I do work with them a lot. Um, so here's what I will say about that. I, I think you definitely should have all tribal facilities um, in your jurisdiction reservation should be communicating and passing information back and forth. Um, and when it comes to the transfer of data from that entity to another government entity inside of the tribe, that is a lot easier of a facilitation than sending it outward. So when we talk about reporting to like CMS and those other regulatory authorities, you really, are beholden to, um, with some leverage and some conversation, to their policies and their requirements. If you want to bill through CMS, you're going to have to follow CMS practice. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't have a conversation with them about, like, we're not a typical, you know, we're not just some hospital that's down the street. Like, we're a, a tribal nation, and, and we want to have longer, sustainable conversations with you. And that can apply not just to a federal um, thing like CMS. It can also be Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, you know, anybody. Um, and they are willing to listen if you, if you come to the table and, and present your case and, and talk about what you want to do. Um, oftentimes, technology will facilitate this really well. Um, especially in the, the health side of things. There's so much technology now that's designed to kind of help you understand all of the regulations and rules and what to do. And really having someone who's knowledgeable in that and they put in um, basically workarounds or, or pull-throughs for changes to a, a template stamped, um, like Epic or something it just stamps out, like this is what should go to here or there. And having those um, bypasses so that you're not um, deviating from your data sovereignty for the tribe. Um, is really valuable. So I think it's a, a conversation that you would definitely want to bring IT people and, and stuff into. But I'll let Carrie talk about anything she may know a lot. I think you've covered it pretty well. I don't know that I have a lot to add on that one. There is, we'll take one more question. There's a question about Medicaid eligibility data. Um, how is tribal access to this kind of data impacted by tribal, federal, and state authorities, given that this information is generally created by the state, but also reported to the federal government? Um, 
any general applicable ideas um, in regard to tribal access to Medicaid eligibility data that um, any of you could speak to? Yeah, so as far as, um, so you're right that that's a really good example of where you have kind of three different jurisdictions all overlapping and making things really muddy sometimes. Um, so states generally kind of are given deference for, for Medicaid programs and, and have control over most of Medicaid data. Um, so, you know, tribes that have the, the best access to Medicaid data, the, um, especially like enrollment data, which I think is maybe what you're getting at there, um, you know, tend to be, uh, there, are, there are a number of states that have like specific Medicaid enrollment, like data use agreements set up with tribes, or they have, um, like regular reporting of like, um, especially with the like unwinding that's been going on over the past year or two. Um, some states have set up like specific like unwinding reports that have been going out to tribes in their areas. Um, but that's kind of, you know, based on the relationship between the state and the tribe. Um, so tribes should also be able to get different kinds of Medicaid data from the federal government, but that's kind of one of those areas where, like I said, like the federal, some of the federal agencies under HHS have not been as cooperative in sharing their health data with tribes um, as we would have hoped. Uh, so it's kind of an area that NIHB can continues to work with CMS to try to make sure that Medicaid and Medicare data is more accessible. But um, yeah, there's there's still some work to be done there too. Uh, but I, you know, tribes certainly have the, the right to request access to that data. Um, and so they can go directly to CMS um, to request any of the data that is reported to CMS. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Carrie and Pamela. And thank you everybody for attending. Um, our session on Tribal Public Health Authority today. Um, we just have a few um, announcements in ways of how you can get involved um, in data modernization activities um, related to um, tribal health. And um, first off, we would like um, if you have not already done so, um, um, people to sign up for our Tribal Data Modernization Learning, Learning Community Listserv to find out more about sessions we'll be coming, um, coming um, up with um, later on in the year and um, next year. Uh, do consider um, the Public Health Informatics Institute Data Modernization Learning Community um, which um, provides additional support in data modernization efforts um, going on across the country. Um, the Emory um, Rollins Health Education Institute um, has a course that may be of interest, um, uh, the Introduction to Applied Public Health Informatics. And um, the links to these will be provided in the chat um, for anybody interested. And we ask that everyone please complete today's evaluation. Um, having that information from everybody is really helpful in improving future sessions that we have. Um, some funding opportunities that um, people can take advantage of um, within your jurisdictions um, and organizations. Um, there's the CDC Foundation's Workforce Acceleration in Initiative, um, which is uh, is to strengthen um, public health authority capacity to deliver information system improvements through technology and data experts. Um, we are providing a link to that. I believe um, that RFP um, the deadline to apply for that is July 21st. And um, there is the Public Health Data Modernization Tribal Implementation Center request for proposals um, that is also out and we will provide the link to that as well. Uh, again, please fill out the um, session evaluation and we thank everybody for your time. 
um, we value your engagement and um, the information sharing that this session provides. Um, we also have our contact information. If you have any questions, concerns, ideas for future sessions, please feel free to email us. Um, my colleague, Sarah Price, the program director um, for infrastructure and in infectious disease at NIHB and myself, the project coordinator for disease surveillance. Um, thank you again and have a good day, everyone.